Ezra was only 21 months old when we walked into that doctor's office, and I had no clue what to expect. And like I tell every parent, if you're not getting what you want, call back. My husband and I have five kids, and two who are autistic. Our three-year-old has more mild autism level one, which just means he needs a little less help. And Ezra, our seven-year-old, has nonverbal autism. He communicates through an iPad. He's level three autism, which mainly just means he needs a little bit more support. Both of these boys are such an important part of our family, and the examples we'll be sharing today in this video are from them. If you want to get an official diagnosis, please see a professional. When Ezra was little, I knew something was up. I didn't know if it was autism, but I recognized he was delayed in almost all of his milestones. He had no eye contact, no speech, no obvious social engagement. But back then, I had to work hard to even get a doctor to look at him because of how young he was. But when we finally got him on the waiting list, I was so relieved. Ezra was only 21 months old when we walked into that doctor's office, and I had no clue what to expect. The video that explains Ezra's diagnosis is right here. And Simon, our three-year-old, who has level one autism with no intellectual delay, his diagnosis experience was completely different. And we share that in detail in this video. And since Ezra and Simon's experiences were so different, I wanted to know for sure what's supposed to happen at an autism assessment. So I asked a professional. We used to live in an RV with all five kids visiting the national parks in the USA. Our family posts daily of our unique normal, so please consider subscribing. Meet Dr. Spenlove. He's a clinical psychologist who specializes in autism assessment of infant and toddlers. He actually helped create the second edition of ADOS, which is the gold standard for autism testing. And this is what he had to say. What happens at an assessment for autism? So for a parent, if you're coming to see me to get your child assessed for autism, there's going to be interviews, lots of interviews. And I ask every mother the same questions about alcohol, drugs, and tobacco, and all kinds of so things. So don't get offended. Yeah, it's not an offense. <laughs> You can't assume anything, so you just ask everybody. <laughs> a parent should expect to be interviewed in detail about the child's history, a good history from prenatal to present that reviews pregnancy, infancy, toddlerhood, family relationships, school relationships, if there's a school involved, all that sort of thing, history, history, okay? And then another interview to talk about how they're doing currently. So the parent should expect a lot of questions. Come prepared to answer as much as you can, as best as you can. I'm not. I'm not looking for exact dates. Give me ballparks, right? Were they walking by around 12 months? So just general understanding of your child's development, that's, that's for the parent. The child should expect to come in and sit at a table to do structured, standardized testing. Now this is very hard for the little ones because they don't often have practice with it and they're in homes or schools or daycares where they want and they get, right? And in, a, in an assessment with me, I give, but I take. <laughs> okay, explain that. <laughs> so here, here's this form board. Once you're done with that, I take it and we go to the next item. And I give and I take and I give and I take because I have a list of items to get through to see how far they can go. Uh, when a parent is watching or helping with that assessment, they have to understand they can't help with any of it. We don't want to see what the child does with uh, parental assistance. We have to know what the child does on their own. Okay, And be prepared. They're going to scream. They're going to cry. Most parents apologize to me. Because you're taking me. like 10 toys away from them. It's more like, like ten... two toys every 30 seconds. Okay. Yeah. So the child should expect to sit at a table and do a standardized assessment. Now, the standardized cognitive assessment depends on how old they are and what they can do. The two I use for anybody under five is either the Mullen Scales of Early Learning or the WIPSI, which is the Wexler Preschool Primary Scale of Intelligence. Those are the two, and those are very structured and standardized, which means I have to do the administration of it the same way with every child. After that, depending on how old the child is, if they're really young, it's really just the cognitive measure and the ADOS. And the ADOS is super fun. It's Because it's play. It's absolute play, and they get to choose what they want to do. And the, the ADOS is designed to, to elicit a child's natural, reciprocal, social interaction and communication skills. It also has what I call booby traps, because there are things all throughout it that are supposed to trigger their their sensory interests, things that spin, things that are shiny, things that are squishy, fuzzy, scratchy, there's all that stuff in there. So there's free play and then we move on to other activities like um, balloons and bubbles. The whole purpose of that is to see if they request and if they're having joint interactive play with me. Birthday parties for baby dolls. If they're really young, we give the baby doll a bath. The bath time, it's all to see if they have imaginative play where they can join in and say, oh, it's actually a person, and watch the baby, and all these things. So that's the main two things that kids should expect. The parents should be involved in all that as well, either helping with the first part, but always observing the ADOS. The ADOS requires a parent to be present for the toddler module and modules one and two. There's five modules. Okay. 
Modules three and four, they don't require a parent because they're for adolescents and adults. But in the toddler, module one and module two realm, if I do something that the child doesn't respond to, I have to ask the parent to try, like calling a name. So-and-so, if they look and give me eye contact, they're done, we move on. But I have four trials to call a name. If that doesn't work, I turn to the parent and I say, hey, your turn. If that doesn't work, then make a familiar noise, like or whatever you want to make to see if it makes them turn around and look at you. And then the final step is do anything you need to do. Pick them up, tickle them, turn his head to your face, whatever you got to do. So a parent can expect to be interviewed and to be a part of the assessment in terms of observation and sometimes being asked to do pieces of it to see how they respond to the parent. After that, they should be able to get a report, a full written report of all the measures that were given. Our ethical code of psychologists says if you give a measure, you write it up and you have to give feedback on it. They should have a feedback session scheduled and get a full report with all the measures and everything about the child's scores in a report with diagnoses and recommendation. And a feedback session where it can all be described in an understandable way, which I understand sometimes is like drinking from a fire hose. Yeah, especially if you're first getting the news and you're surprised. It's not a fire hose. You just dropped me into a pool and I didn't know how to swim, okay? That's <laughs> what it's end. like. That's sometimes. what that felt like, yeah. Yeah, we never got any kind of feedback with Ezra. It was just, here's your paper, diagnosis, Go on your way. If you take your child to a, a psychologist mm -hmm. and they do this full thing and you get just three lines on the paper back, you're welcome, you're, you have the right, you're always welcome to call them and say, I need more, tell me more. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, you have the right to know every piece of data that was used to derive a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. If I'm called to a court situation, I have to be able to back up my diagnosis with the data. Well, you're my judge as a parent. I gotta prove my case Thank to you. you, right? Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I sound that. And like I tell every parent, if you're not getting what you want, call back. Be, the, be in their bonnet. Be the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. There's a whole host of measures out there that claim to be autism measures. And they are, but they're called screening measures, not diagnostic. The only diagnostic measures we have for autism are the ADOS-2 and the ADIR. So which evaluations did you use for Simon? With you, we did an interview, the Vineland, the Basque, and the SRS-2. That's what you did. And with Simon, we also did the Mullen. And the Mullen Scales of Early Learning has four scales on it, which is visual reception, fine motor, receptive language, expressive language, and, and then the ADOS 2. So that was four for you and two for him, six total to understand it across two days of assessment, four hours total in person. Please put in the comments your experience with an autism assessment. Is it similar to what Dr. Spenlow was talking about, or was it different? Are there benefits of diagnosing autism young? We answer that question here, and our autism playlist is here.